Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back into the studio for this next installment in our Kronos 3.0 or Kronos the third scale version maquette series. Either way, it's a long and arduous name to pronounce. And it's been a long and arduous sculpture to make. Soon it's coming up on one year since I started this sculpture, which is crazy considering it's not very big. But I guess the world went crazy as well in 2020, so perhaps it's only appropriate. Either way, we are charging headlong towards the finish line here. Let's get into it. We spent the previous episode building the foundation of any sculpture, as far as I can see it at least, which is the box in the egg. In a sculpture like this, with no defined ground plane, the box in the egg and the relationship between the two in height and width sets the proportions of my figure. So in other words, the size of the limbs will be referenced off the size of the torso, which consists of the box and the egg, of course. It's a little different than what I would do if I had a defined ground plane, and if you're interested in seeing that approach, you can check that out in my videos on sculpting a standing half life size figure. As an overarching process, it's not really about what steps is being taken, however, that changes from project to project, but it's how I problem solve my way through any given project. I attempt to always start out with something that I believe to be true, some part that I can trust in. Then everything else gets referenced off that truth in one way or another. Truth built on top of truth is the result and if done well will end up with a successful end product. With my foundation well set up last time I can begin moving my sculpture forward into the next step. This is where things actually start to look like something which is refreshing. Now I will use my box and egg to build the contours of the body out from the four views. Those four views are the front, the back and the two sides, 90 degrees to the front and the back view. And these four views are really all we need. We have some of our views here because of the sculpture somewhat restricted. So if you're a beginner, it might be better to attempt this while having a clear view from all four sides to make things a little easier, a little simpler for you. But as I'm somewhat familiar with the technique, I can get away with having some of the views a little obstructed. In order to visualize what this contour part of the technique really is, what I'm doing to the clay, essentially, you can try to imagine that from each of the four views, you will be creating a two-dimensional outline of what the figure looks like. So from the side view, for example, I'm looking for the outline of the belly and the outline of the buttocks, amongst other things, of course, there's more to it than that. Now this sends me down what I consider to be the right path, an accurate outline. There are however several issues that we need to consider using this technique. Let's start with the one that's the most applicable to any situation you might find yourself in and it's ac applicable here as well. As you place contour from one view and move on to the next view, you'll realize that the contour from the front, the outline of the figure from the front, actually sits inside the outline of the figure from the side. So the contour from one view is internal information from the next view. So if we simply build our contours vertically up and down the figure from the front view, we sacrifice the integrity or accuracy of the internal information from the side view. So at the same time as I'm working the contour from the front, I need to pay attention to where the contour from the front needs to be placed from the side view, as I want my internal information to be in the right place once I observe from the side and I want my contour to be accurate from the front. The contour moves in space. It does not sit in a vertical line heading up and down the figure. If we observe from the front view, some parts of the contour will sit closer to us than others. Some parts of the contour will lean away from us and others will lean towards us. However, we cannot accurately observe depth. Now, if you are trained and experienced, you can make educated guesses which is what I'm trying to do here, but in general, we cannot accurately observe depth, so we should refrain from even trying to do so. Instead, we should attempt to turn depth into left and right, which we can observe easily. So to observe where the contour in the front needs to be placed, I have to observe from the side, where the contour from the front becomes internal information, and I can turn the depth into left and right. In order to achieve this, I suggest drawing the internal information, the information that sits inside the outline from each view while building the contour. 
so that the contour can be placed correctly early on. This is another massive advantage to beginning with a box and an egg. We have given ourselves a bit of canvas to draw the internal information on, a little bit of width from all views that will help us begin placing contours accurately in space early on, as well as placing them accurately on a two-dimensional level. In the beginning, this process can look pretty messy. In order to stay organized and not lose myself in a sea of clay, I try to put the pieces of clay down in the direction of the form that they are representing. In this way, the sculpture visually reads pretty clearly, without me having to spend a ton of time clarifying the surface, which I don't want to spend time on anyway at, at this moment. Notice how I work a lot with my hands, for example. I do this to force myself not to get too particular and work on details. My hands cannot apply clay in a too detailed fashion. I need tools for that purpose. So I'll wait with tools until a bit later when details are more appropriate. The only tools you'll see me use here in the beginning is gonna be drawing tools. I draw a lot on the surface of the clay and this keeps things clear as well. Especially the structure that I established last time we worked on this piece is continually going to be reinforced with drawing. If I keep the structure clear, then it's always clear to me where I strayed from the path if something looks wrong or goes wrong. If I have to re-identify my structures, then maybe a symmetry issue is not actually a symmetry issue, but an issue with where the center line was drawn. But if I maintain the first center line that I drew, then a symmetry issue is always down to issues with the contours. A known issue is easy to fix, especially when you know why it occurred. A known issue without a known cause can be really hard to diagnose. I mentioned several issues to consider. Here is one major one that is important in this particular sculpture because the figure is twisting. In other words, the ribcage and pelvis are not facing in the, in the same direction. They have different front planes. This is an issue because the contour from the front view of the pelvis is not going to be the contour from the front view of the ribcage. So if I simply attempt to work from the front plane of the pelvis, I'll be fine as long as I'm working around the area of the pelvis. However, I will run into issues once I progress up into the ribcage, as now I'm placing contours in the wrong place in space potentially. In order to combat this, I pay close attention to what the contour I'm working on belongs to. If it belongs to the ribcage, like the outline of the breasts from the side or the outline of the latimus dorsi muscles from the front and back, I'll work from the front plane of the ribcage. A twisting figure presents another set of issues as well. When observing from the front of the pelvis, the ribcage will look really small, as it is going to be observed from the side. And when observing the front of the ribcage, the pelvis looks tiny, which in turn makes the ribcage look, look gigantic, as the pelvis is not as deep as it is wide, and we're used to seeing the pelvis and the ribcage head on together. This can make for some awkward looking proportions, which can be problematic, even though the proportions might be correct. So in order to deal with this, which I really don't get into that much in this video, I ended up cheating a little bit on the proportions in an attempt to make the figure look as good as possible from every view. Essentially, what I did was I made the pelvis a bit deeper and the ribcage a touch more narrow from the front of the ribcage. An issue often brought up about sculpture is how to make it look good from all angles, which I think is a valid concern. But often enough, I think we need to sacrifice some angles and let them be mediocre in order to support the other angles from which the work looks hopefully a lot better, perhaps even good. I'm using pretty poor photo reference for this piece. The ideas I had while photographing reference has changed a little bit. I've made some tweaks and I've run into issues of not easily being able to get models into the studio to produce new reference. So a lot of this is up to my own imagination if you will, or my own knowledge of anatomy, probably more so. Now, this is made much easier and better controlled by using a structural approach where I eliminate one issue at a time and build one truth on top of the other. Whenever I wander into unfamiliar territory, I begin with drawing and comparative measurements. I'm progressing upwards towards the top of the torso from the pelvis as I feel the most confident in the dimensions of the box or the pelvis. 
As I head upwards into the torso, I always revert back to drawing first and using comparative measurements. Measuring something that I already feel confident in and then comparing how it measures up to the new element that I'm introducing. For example, as I begin to close in on the width of the shoulders from the end of one clavicle to the other, I measure the width of my pelvis and check on my reference how the width of the pelvis relates to the width of the clavicles. I prefer to use bony points while doing this, so the little bump on top of the shoulders, which is the distal end of the clavicles, meaning the outer end of the clavicle, is what I use when comparing to the width of the pelvis. And bone is obviously more reliable when it comes to measuring than flesh, as it has a tendency to not move as much as flesh. The structures that we set up in the beginning can now begin to inform new structures that I'll use in a similar fashion, such as the distal end of the clavicles from where I will begin to build the outline of the shoulders. These two points in space also dictate some internal information, as my pectoral muscles or chest muscles must reach out to the shoulder from the center line. In a very similar fashion to how the belly must extend from the center line out to each of the aces points on the pelvis. Another new structure I set up as I progress is the edge of the ribcage, extending out from the bottom of the sternum and down the side of the belly. This feature needs to be a lot more specific than you would think in order to appear convincing. It also has real implications for how solid the ribcage ends up looking and being. The bottom corners of the ribcage, which is the end of the edge of the ribcage when observed from the front, has a relationship to the two aces points of the pelvis best observed from the side view. So if the ribcage is twisting on top of the pelvis, then the two bottom corners of the ribcage will be in different places over the top of each respective aces point below it. In this scenario, the right bottom corner of the ribcage sits in front of the aces point, while the left bottom corner sits behind the aces point. In order for the ribcage to appear solid, they also need to have the same front plane as the sternum. Now, if they don't have the same front plane as the sternum, and they don't relate symmetrically across to each other, then we will have one side of the ribcage be deeper than the other, which is not very realistic and probably a serious medical condition. The edge of the ribcage heading from the bottom of the sternum down to each of the bottom corners of the ribcage must be symmetrical as well, or at least pretty close to it. So you have to take into account the tilt of the ribcage and where the bottom corners are placed in space in order to accomplish this. Last thing we'll talk about a bit today, and we'll get more into it next time, is the shoulder girdle. The shoulder girdle is made up of the clavicle and the scapulas. Some easy things to always keep in mind regarding the shoulder girdles are, once you begin placing it, you are placing the shoulders within the borders of the body from the side view. So unless those borders of the body from the side view are well set up, do not begin placing the shoulder girdle. You will end up locking yourself into a position for your shoulders, and if the outline of your body needs to change, you might run into a scenario where the shoulders are placed too far forward or too far back. You want to solve one issue at a time and not potentially create two issues for yourself at once. Solve the outline of the body first, and then place the shoulders within those borders to ensure that you are in full control. The shoulder girdle dictates the position of the shoulders as where the clavicles and scapulas meet is the origin of the shoulders. So I like to place this connection in space and then build the shoulder from there, the shoulder muscles from there, and the arms obviously extending out from there as well. Put very simply, the shoulder girdle has a diamond shape when observed from above. So it's narrower at the shoulder and wider towards the middle of the body. This means that where the scapulas and clavicles meet, sits back from the pit of the neck and forward from the C7. This is not always the case and the diamond shape can be crooked one way or the other depending on your model's action or the way they are built. Some people will, for example, be hulking figures with the shoulders further forward and others have a very proud upright stance with the shoulders pulled very far backwards. So the shoulder girdle dictates quite a lot when it comes to how a person look. In our scenario here, the shoulders are forcefully pulled back by chronos. So I'm placing the meeting point of the clavicle and scapulas further back in order for the shoulders to read and look like they are being pulled backwards. 
So the diamond shape of the shoulder girdle on my sculpture here is going to be pretty crooked. We'll start off next video on this project continuing to talk about the shoulder girdle as the conversation needed to cover everything there is to cover about this subject is quite substantial. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did and want to learn sculpture from me or just support the channel, check out my Patreon page. Hit the subscribe button and the bell to be notified whenever a new video comes out, and if you enjoyed the video, click the like button and share it with your friends and family, it helps me out a lot. Thank you for watching, stay creative, and I hope to see you in the next one.